Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Again, we'll be ready to go right back where we left off, and uh, that'd be in Acts chapter 2, verse 47. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we always like to make it known that all the past programs are available on videotape. We now have a good number of them transcribed into booklet form, so if you'd be interested in any of that, you call us or write to us, and uh, we'll get our information out to you. Again, I always like to make it plain. I never mind asking my doctrinal position. I'll gladly write it or speak it and let you know what I believe and why we believe it. I trust that the Holy Spirit has kept me from error. I don't claim to have all the answers. I don't claim that I'm right and everybody else is wrong. But uh, we found that so many people have just gotten a new lease on Scripture when they begin to realize how all of these things are chronologically unfolding. It's not a mix mash. It's not all mixed up. It's so clearly laid out, if we'll leave it that way. And so again, if some of you, uh, every day we get a call from someone who just caught the program for the first time. So if you happen to be one of those, we're just an informal Bible study. We're not underwritten. The good Lord has provided just enough funds. See, now Margaret just gave me our balance again a little while ago. We have 6,000 in the bank, and we have 6,000 invoices that just came in. <laughs> and that's just the way. See, she's nodding her head, and that's just the way it's been now for four years. We, we never have to beg off and beg somebody to wait. We always pay our bills on time, but we never, we never build a great big cushion. But... Uh, that's the way we want it. And as I've stressed so often, uh, no one takes any money out of the ministry. There's no salaries paid. Everything uh, goes to purchase the television time and, of course, now the books and so forth. All right, so much for announcement. Let's go right back into Acts chapter 2. And remember, Peter has been preaching to the nation of Israel and trying to get across to them that the one they crucified was indeed the Christ, their King, their Messiah. And so now many of them have been convicted, and we found up in verse 41 that 3,000, there on the day of Pentecost. And then we came down and saw through verses 40 through, through 46 that they sold everything that they owned and put it into a common kitty. And then you come down to verse 47, and that's where we left off, <clears throat> where they were praising God, having favor with all the people. See, now, now true Christianity, that's the way it is. You know, a, a true Christian doesn't become contentious just for the sake of being contentious. We contend for the faith. We stand for what we feel is the truth, but we don't become contentious. Uh, I remember I told a, a young pastor years and years ago who was seemingly calm. Sometimes you ask for it. You put yourself in that kind of a position, and, and that's not a Christian testimony at all. And uh, I'm afraid a lot of times that uh, spiritual leaders have done just that. They, they, they invite controversy. Now, I'm not talking about compromise, and I'm not talking about a milquetoast Christianity, not at all. But to just simply become obnoxious for the sake of being contentious, I, I don't believe that that's scriptural. And so even these Jewish believers, and you know they had a lot of opposition from their fellow Jews who were totally against any of this. And yet they couldn't find fault with these Jewish believers. They had favor with all the people. All right, now the last part of the verse, and this is why I was glad we ran out of time a moment ago because I didn't have time to touch this verse anyway. And what does it say? And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now here's a word, again, we have to identify and define. Church. The word church, and I'm going to go to the board on this one. The word translated church in, in our Bible comes from the Greek word ecclesia. Just a very simple word from where we get ecclesiastics or ecclesiastical pertaining to religious hierarchies and so forth. But the Greek word ecclesia is translated church. It's also translated assembly. 
Now here's where we have to be careful. Not every time you see the word church is it the New Testament body of Christ. And here's where you have to learn to separate and put things in their rightful place. Let me give you one good example. Turn on over a couple pages to Acts chapter 7. I'm already throwing a curve at the class here in the studio. I told him we'd go to 1 Corinthians, but I just happened to think of this one in Acts 7 first. Acts chapter 7, and this is Stephen. And again, Stephen is preaching to the nation of Israel, albeit it's seven years after Pentecost. But again, the language is so plain all the way through that he's addressing Jews. And he goes all the way through Israel's history, starting with Abraham. And he brings them on down through time. Now I want you to come in with me at verse oh, 35, Acts 7, verse 35, so that you get the true setting. I had one gentleman write from the television audience that I was all mixed up, that the church began clear back with Moses. Well, bless his heart, he just didn't know his Greek. You got it? Uh, Acts chapter 7, starting with verse 35. This Moses, Stephen says, whom they refused, that is the Israelites in Egypt, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same, Moses, did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after that he showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness those forty years. Now Stephen is making the illusion that Moses was just a forerunner of the Christ. He was a type of the Christ. And this is what Stephen is trying to emphasize that the second deliverer, the Christ, they crucified. And that's what he's driving home. But all I want to show you is the setting that he's referring to. He's taking them back to when Israel had come out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and were encamped around Mount Sinai under Moses' leadership. All right? Verse 37 again, This is that Moses who said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall you hear. Now that was Moses speaking to the Israelites. Verse 38, Stephen says, This, this Jesus that he's proclaiming, this is he that Moses was talking about that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him in Mount Sinai. Was that a New Testament church? What's well, this the word? See, and that's where this gentleman evidently got the idea. The church already began back there in, in Sinai. No, it didn't. That wasn't a church as we understand the church back there in Sinai. But you know what it was? Now, to make this a little plainer, I should have put up here, it's a called out assembly. Called out assembly. That's also the word ecclesia. Now think for a moment. Wasn't Israel a called out assembly? Sure they were. God called them and led them out of Egypt and camped them in Sinai and they became a called out assembly. Not a church. They didn't have deacons. They didn't have bishops. <laughs> they didn't have pastors. They were under the law. They were under Moses. A whole different setting than from what anything pertains to the church. But it's the same word. It was a called out assembly. You see that? All right. Now while you're still in Acts, let's turn to chapter 19. And again, I want the camera on this or people won't believe their ears when they're out there in their living room. That this same word now, of course, is not translated church. It's translated assembly, but it's not a godly assembly. It's an ungodly assembly. Acts chapter 19. And Paul and Barnabas, is it? Have come to Ephesus. And there's been such a turning from idolatry to Paul's gospel that the makers of idols saw their business going down the drain, the silversmiths. And so there's a big uproar. And so they're trying to get the emotions of these idolatrous Ephesians 
to turn on Paul and these new converts. All right, let's just drop in for sake of time again at, uh, oh, verse 28. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, these idolatrous Ephesians. Acts 19, verse 28. They were full of wrath, and they cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. What have you got? Well, you've got a mob. You've got a riot. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples or his followers permitted him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into theater. It's a riot in there, Paul. They'll kill you. Verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another. For the ecclesia, if you please. See? Is that a church? Hardly. But it was a called out assembly. Because who had called them out? The silversmiths, see? And so here's where we have to be so careful that when you see the word church, you don't automatically think it's the church as we know it, or as Paul refers to it as the body of Christ. Now I'm going to show you these verses so that you'll see it very clearly, the difference. All right, now in Acts chapter 2, of course, the word ecclesia was a called out assembly and that's indeed what these Jewish believers are. They have separated themselves from the mainstream of Judaism now. They have believed that Jesus was the Christ. They are assembling themselves in fellowship, breaking of bread. We saw that last program. And they are a called out assembly. So what are they? Well, they're also a church, but not necessarily the body of Christ but they're a called out assembly. All right, now let me show you the difference of the church as we understand it, or at least as I'm seeing it now. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And here we have a new connotation. This called out assembly is not just called usually the church in Paul's writings, but it's the church which is his what? Body. Or the body which is the church. Now that's what qualifies it, even though it's the same Greek word ecclesia, and indeed the church today is a called out assembly, see? But it's a called out assembly now whose head is in heaven as the head of the body, and we are the body. Now it's a big difference. See, Peter doesn't teach that back in Acts. Peter makes no mention that Christ is the head of this called out assembly, and they are part of him. There's not a word of that in there, and that's what I try to point out, that it's just as important to see what the scripture does not say as what it does say. Because see, there's, here's where we've all been, I call it victims, and I'm just like everybody else. We've been victims of a lot of this, assuming that something is in a scripture when it isn't there. And I feel we just don't have right to do that. All right, now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 12, for as the body, now Paul is talking about the human body, for as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now what are we talking about? The church which is his body. Whether it's a believer in China, or a believer in Europe, or a believer here in America, what are we? We're members of that one body. Well, that wasn't true before. All right, read on. Verse 13, for by one Spirit, capitalized. So who is it? Holy Spirit. So by the Holy Spirit are we, I'll underline that next word, not just the spiritual elite, not just the ones who have somehow reached a higher plateau, but who's been baptized into the body? All, all, from the least to the greatest. 
The Spirit, as we became believers, has placed us into the body of Christ. Now we know that some believers are far more unspiritual than other believers, but we're still members of the body. See, I have a pinky that just about got clipped off one time. See, it's not all there. Neither is this one. But what? It's still part of me. It's still part of me. It's imperfect, but it's still me. And the same way with the body of Christ. See, and that's what Paul is using here as, as a picture. That not every believer is all that he should be or could be, but he's still in the body. And we can't take that away. All right, so whether by... Uh, we're all baptized into the one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free. Makes no difference, our station in life. We have all been made to drink of that. What? Many. All right, now let's follow it. Go into Ephesians chapter 1. Now, of course, I think you realize we're in Paul's letters already. And now Paul is constantly making reference to the church, which is his body. Still the word ecclesia, still a called out assembly, but with one difference. This church has the head in heaven, the body here is on earth, but you can't separate them. And this is what we have to watch for. All right, Ephesians 1, oh my, let's start in at verse 22. Ephesians 1, verse 22. Oh, we got to go back to verse 17, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him above, uh, uh, from the dead. And then verse 22, and he hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the, what's the word? Head over all things to the church. What church? Next verse. The church which is his body. You see the difference? The church which is his body. The fullness of him that full filleth all in all. Now that word fullness in the Greek also means complement. We are the complement of the head. It's the same word only in the Hebrew, of course, back in Genesis when Eve was given to Adam. What was she given to be? His complement and became part of him. And now as we go to Ephesians chapter 5, see that's why Paul brings in the physical marriage relationship between husband and wife as the beautiful picture of Christ and the church which is his body. Now, I'm pointing this out just to show that Peter doesn't bring anything like this out at all. Peter doesn't mention the body of Christ. Peter doesn't mention being baptized into the body of Christ. He hasn't had that revelation yet, and he's unaware of it. And so he's merely talking about a called out assembly of Jews who have separated themselves from the mainstream of Judaism by virtue of their believing that Jesus was the Christ. You got that? All right, now Ephesians 5. We almost have to start with verse 21. Submitting yourselves, Paul writes. Now remember, whenever Paul writes, number one, he writes to believers. Number two, it's usually a Gentile congregation. There were some Jews in them, I'm sure, but it's predominantly to the believer who are members of a Gentile congregation. All right? Sub, uh, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as. See? Now here's where a lot of people miss the point when they think of the biblical teaching that the husband is to be over the wife and she's to be submissive. They miss the whole point of it. The Bible never gives the husband the authority to downtrod his wife. She is never to be his slave and his servant, but she is a part of him. They are one. See, and this is the scriptural biblical teaching. And now Paul, by inspiration, is making it so plain that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ 
is the head of the church. Now, I've pointed it out more than once. I don't know if I have on television, but I know I do in my classes. Do you realize that it is never scripturally correct? Now, I'm getting my language from the world, aren't I? <laughs> Instead of politically correct, I'm going to talk about something that is scripturally correct. You know, it is not scripturally correct to refer to Christ as our king. Now, I even heard a pastor that I dearly love and think the world of. He preached his whole sermon some time ago that Christ is our king. And I thought, oh, no, he isn't. He is the king of kings. He's Lord of lords. Absolutely, he's the God of creation. But to the church, he is not the king. He's the head of the body. Now, what a difference that makes. Because, see, if he's our king, now, this is the way I look at it. If he's our king, then what are we? We're subjects, see? And Paul never gives the illusion that we're subjects that have to kowtow to his every command. We are now what? We're part of him, just like the wife is part of the, of the husband. And you bring that on down to the next step, the same way Scripture does not teach that a wife is the subject of a husband king, is she? No. She submits to his headship, but not as a king. Well, in the same way, if you ever find that Paul teaches that Christ is the king of the church, again, I invite you to show me, because I can't find it. But it's this constant reference to the fact that he is the head of the body. And as the physical head is connected to the physical body, as the husband is connected to the wife, so Christ is connected to us as members of the body of Christ. All right? Now come on over to verse 24. Therefore, in Ephesians 5, therefore as the church, that is again the body, is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. But now don't lose the connotation. Husbands, we are to have the same attitude toward our wife that Christ has to the church. And when you've got a husband with that kind of an attitude, I'll tell you what, no lawyer is ever going to have to touch him. You're not going to have a divorce problem. Because, you see, there's a whole different attitude when we treat our wives as Christ treats the church. And what is that? Total love to the place that he died for her. I often wonder how many American husbands today would die for their wives. Quite a question, isn't it? Would we really be able to say, I love her so much that if I have to give my life for her tomorrow, I'll do it gladly? Now, that's a real test, isn't it? But that's how much we're to love her. All right, now read on. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives. Boy, that's always another whole, whole lesson. <laughs> do you realize the Scripture never tells wives to love their husbands? Never. Oh, I know Peter tells the mothers to teach their daughters <laughs> how to love a husband, but it's never commanded the woman to love your husband. But here it is, husbands love your wives. Now why? Well, it all goes back to creation. Because God created Adam with the ability to love his helpmate. But he also created in Eve an ability to what? Respond. See, and that's what God does with us. When he saves us and places us into the body, if our salvation is genuine, we're going to have an innate ability to what? Love him in return. That's part of it. And see, that's what so many people miss. How can you get this excited about the Bible? How can you get this excited about the Christian life? Well, hey, unless you've experienced it, you can't explain it. But it's, it's an innate desire now to please the head. All right, read on. So he loved the church and gave himself for it. And then verse 26 and 27, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, not with baptismal water, scripture. Verse 27, that he might present it, the body, the church, to himself a glorious ecclesia, a glorious called out assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy, set apart, without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. 
Oh, now I gotta, well, I'm, I'm not gonna skip it. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his, what? Body. You see that? For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones, because we've been united, just like husband and wife. And so for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and they, the husband and wife, shall be one flesh. Now verse 32. This is a great... This is one of the things I'm sure he referred to in that little letter we read last program. Paul writes things that are hard to be understood. Well, Peter hadn't got the full impact of this yet. That now we as Gentile believers are made one with Christ. But I speak concerning, verse 32, I speak concerning Christ and the church, the body. Nevertheless, every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife sees her reverence her husband. Now, isn't it amazing that Paul just constantly, in these series of verses, about 10 or 12 verses, constantly flips back and forth between Christ and the church and the husband and the wife. Why? Because it's a perfect, synonymous relationship. Christ is the same to us as the husband is to the wife, and the husband and the wife relationship is the same as Christ and the church. Now, you see, Peter doesn't bring any of this in in chapter 2. He can't. He wasn't expected to because the Lord hadn't revealed all this yet to Peter. This was something that was still waiting out in the wings, see? All right, got a half a minute left. Let's come back to Acts chapter 2. And again... Verse 47, backing up to where we began the half hour. Boy, we got one verse done that time, huh? Well, we'll go into chapter 3 next program. Verse 47 again, praising God, having favor with all the people. They weren't making fools of themselves. They weren't being obnoxious. And the Lord added to that called out assembly of believing Jews daily. Every day, more were being added, such as should be saved. Well, you don't join an assembly without salvation. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to... Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you, and be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.